Okay, hi everyone. This is the second lecture in the uh, CSE 564 Visualization Visual Analytics and we're going to be talking about applications and most of the time we're going to talk about basic tasks. So first, in case you don't know, this, the course website is here. CS Storybook in you, Müller teaching CSE 564 and everything needed is there. Syllabus, course notes will be there, slides and lab assignments and the course policy and then you know things like this and this is the second lecture we're going to have applications of visual analytics basic tasks and data types and <clears throat> to begin with these are the, the data types that every computer science person will know this is like primitive there are you know character integer float double array numeration and so on these are not going to be the data types we're going to be using in visualization. We're going to be using things like numerical, categorical text, time series, graphs, networks, hierarchies, things like this. So these are basic variables and statistics. So you know, so numeric variable is here, like they basically measure a quantity as a number. So either continuous or discrete. And it's basically about how many and how much. So here on the right hand side we'll see this. On the other hand we'll have um, category variables that describe a quality or characteristic. For example, what type of each category. So we got we see this here. You know, for example, you know, eye color could be one or colors are like could be one, you know. So basically you measure how many like how many people like this color and how many people like this color. How many people like gray and how many people like salmon and so on right so this basically if you visualize it like this this is a categorical variable and so numerical variable usually the most often people think the x-axis is time you know because usually it's like a provides intuitive ordering data value most people think x value is time like this you know it's like they, i've talked to Mostly business people, they always think x is, x axis must be time. They don't think of anything else. And then they have a graph on it or something like this. So, but time is not the only option. You know, it could be something else. It can be over x. Most, mostly engineers know this. That's like x can be something else. And uh, sometimes numeric, sometimes x axis can actually tell a story. For example, if you look at the, you know, the Hooke's law, the, 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 you know, the length, the, the extension of a spring, you know, you see like the elastic region here and permanent deformation and fraction, fra fracture, and you see like delta L, which is like, you know, force and the K, you know, there is like delta L is linear until the elastic region and then elastic region comes and then, you know, it gets a little weak, you know, delta L is actually you know, you know, you cannot pull it anymore. There is resistance in the material, and then all of a sudden it breaks, right? The permanent deformation, and then eventually it fractures. Like, it's like delta L goes to infinity. Delta L goes to infinity. It tells you like a story, right? It's a numerical variable, delta L over F. You know, so anyway, so this is basically a numerical variable, and <clears throat> as I said, it's categorical variables describe a quality or characteristic. And there are really two of them. There's like ordinal, which is like an ordered or ranked arrangement. You know, like they have, there's a certain order to it. Distances need not to be equal. And there is, uh, you know, for example, clothing size, small, medium, large, academic grades, ABC, levels of agreement, don't like, like a little bit or a lot, you know. And another one is nominal, but it's not organized in a logical sequence at all. Could just be gender, business type, eye color, brand. There isn't really, you know, the red is not bigger than green, and then, then you know, something like this. So it's, it cannot be ordered. So it's nominal, has names. Okay, so these are usually plotted as bar charts or as pie charts. You know, we will see about this, like how many how many sectors are optimal, and if you like go in and then assign one to nominal and and, and one to ordinal. This is the number of colors in a bag of M&M candies. So many green, so many red, so many yellow. And this is the customer satisfaction. Goes from very dissatisfied to somewhat dissatisfied to very satisfied. 
So most people didn't like it apparently, which is not good. So if you go and pick them right, then you'll see that this is an ordinal variable and this is a nominal one, okay? Because this can be ordered and this cannot be. So remember this, this difference between ordinal and, and, and nominal. Now, okay, so numbers are good, you know, and, but not everything is expressed in numbers. So, for example, there's in images, when you have images or there's video or text or web logs, whatever it is, there, there isn't really, these are not really expressed in numbers. So you have to somehow, you know, turn them into numbers so you can like do these kind of visualizations that we're going to talk about. So to turn them into numbers, basically what you have to do is you have to do feature analysis. So, and then once the, you know, and then once you have the features, you can count them or you can, like, you can measure them, and then you can basically turn them into numbers, and then you can proceed as, as you do before. You know, but you always should keep the reference to the original data, so you can return to the native domain once, this, once the analysis problem has been solved. Okay? So always have this number back, map it back into the image, or map it back to the video or the text. So, for example, sensor data is often a time series, often large scale. You know, so it's pretty hard to really capture that in a, in a, in from numbers. And so feature analysis, basically one of them could be motif discovery, where you look for like certain fingerprints, right? Certain, certain things that repeat, you know, and you know, as you can basically, it's called that, it's called a motif, like a small subsequence that repeats a lot, that is sort of characteristic. And once you have identified these motifs, you know, then you can count the number of motifs that are around, right? You can say like there's that many red motifs and that many green motifs and that many purple ones, right? And then you can count them. Then you can take a time series and then make a histogram out of the, 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 the motifs, which motifs appear more often than others. That's like one example, right? Another example is you can do a Fourier transform. You can measure the different frequencies in the time series, or you can do a wavelet transform. Both of these create sort of a histo like a, a like a spectrum, and that spectrum is characteristic for this particular sequence. So if you have one spectrum that's mostly low, like low, that doesn't have a lot of high frequencies, then the Fourier spectrum will be very will be limited to the left corner, and if there's a lot of high frequencies, it'll be more extended. Anyway, that is like a unique sequence of Fourier transform coefficients for a particular sequence of time series. Okay, so this basically takes takes a very long sequence and turns it into a pretty small uh, histogram, for example, in this case. Another one is image data. Right, so you have image data here. They have like an array of pixels. And then, you know, images are, you know, you can display the images or you can sort of try to characterize them in some ways. One way to do this is with value histograms. You can make histograms out of them. And basically a histogram is nothing but measuring like the number of pixels for each level of intensity, right? So you have like here it's underexposed, but there's a lot of pixels in the lower, in the lower intensity regions. On the right hand side it's overexposed, there's a lot of pixels in the higher intensity regions. In the middle, it's 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 balanced, right? So it's basically, you know, there's sort of a good. There's some low low intensity pixels, some high intensity pixels, you know. So it's a really good good use of the dynamic range of an image, which is what you want. So you know, so if you're kind of looking for for well, then you can basically now take this histogram here and turn it into like a 250, 100, 256 dimensional vector. And then you can cluster them, and then you can sort of see where am I, you know, the, where is the cluster of the underexposed images, where is the cluster of the high overexposed images, where is the cluster of, of images that are pretty good. Then you can just grab them and, and look at them, you know, maybe, you know, keep them and the other ones you don't keep. You know, if you want to do like an image quality kind of thing, you know, and you can, or you can display them, you can display more of these and less of these. Whatever you like, anyway, it's like you're basically using like a characterization of the image to you to do, uh, you know, a, you know, analytics on it. Turns it on, boss. Okay. 
gradient histogram, you can do the same thing with gradients. You know, not just the particular pixels, you can also do gradients. And a very, very uh, famous method for that, that uses gradients is the SIFT or the scale invariant feature transform. Actually makes histogram of gradients. Okay, so it takes these little key points here, key point areas in the, in the image, which are the areas where where the image is very characteristically interesting, like there's like a lot of edges going on or some textures going on. They're sort of interesting salient features that you want to like, that, we, that you can use to characterize an image by. Okay, and then each of these areas basically looks like this, you know, and uh, these are the pixel values. And then you can make, you can take each of these blocks and make a histogram of gradients. That basically you just make a histogram in, in the directions the gradients are pointing, okay, and then this basically, basically looks like this, right? So this is the very characteristic, sort of takes into account some sort of a neighborhood of, of, of pixels around a certain area, and also tries to figure out what is the general direction, edge directions there. And this is a histogram, right? So each of these is like basically a number, and you can just take all these numbers and line them up and make a big vectors out of a big vector out of them. And then that's, you know, you can use that for clustering and whatever you want to like, whatever you want to do. So, you know. Bank of features is another thing where you, where you try to find certain interesting features in a, in a picture, right? Like certain interesting, you know, uh, this kind of could be derived with SIFT or not, you know, inter characteristic kind of big sub-images. And you can you can just take a very large collection of let's see your shoes, find typical typical features of shoes, then cluster them, and do a K, K, KD tree or something like this, and then and then take each of these partitions and and label them with a with a certain with an index. Okay, so it basically now you have sort of characterized your your space of features into into classes of features. Okay. Then you can take this, and if you take a new shoe, you can find its features, then figure out how many of these sub-features it has, and make a histogram out of it. And this becomes like a characteristic a characterization of the shoe, right? just based as a function of its features. Yeah, so you have this. So, and this is again numbers, right? Now you can compare different shoes using this, right? You can basically have a lot of sports shoes, and you have, uh, you know, women's shoes and whatever you like and they all have characteristic histograms and then you can compare them and figure out you know where, how many you have in which in which group and maybe if you have a new a new shoe you can you can find out what group it should belong to you know things like this so bag of features essentially is this algorithm here it's it's not that it's pretty not not that young algorithm anymore they basically you take a First, you figure out what the features are. You select a large set of images, extract the SIFT feature points of all these images, cut, compute the SIFT descriptor, cluster these feature descriptors, then obtain a visual vocabulary. Basically, this is the visual vocabulary here. And then when a new shoe comes or a new image comes, you figure out this bag of feature descriptor, extract the SIFT feature points of a given image, obtain the descriptor, match the feature descriptors with the vocabulary and build the histogram. Basically, that's what I've said here, right? You, there's nothing but what I said here. You find the features, figure out, f figure out how much of each world they have, and then build the histogram. So now we have a, feed, now you have a, 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 a number again. So video data really is the same. It's just really just essentially a time series of images. You can use similar techniques just now extending them into the time domain you know and then you know you can also turn videos into numbers last thing is text data you know often text data is very raw and unstructured you can also do a feature analysis on text first step is to remove stop words and stem the data and like basically remove words like and and or and, and, and like these, all these words that, that come up every, in every text, so they're not very useful to characterize text. And uh, stem the data, you want to stem the words. Like you don't want to have like past, future tense, or whatever, or he, she, you know, different, different, different genders. Just keep them like in a single root of each word. 
that makes it much easier to compare the records, right? So you have done this, remove the stop words, jam the stem, the data. Then you perform named entity recognition to gain sort of atomic elements to figure out what is what, right? So identify names, locations, actions, numeric quantities and relations, stuff like this. Understand the structure of the sentence. For example, Jim bought 300 shares of Acme Corporation in 2006. You'll find out that Jim is a person, 300 shares is a quantity, Acme is organization, 2006 is a time. All right, so now, now you figured out a lot about this text, right? Now you know, like, you can now go and figure out the, the, all the persons in, in, a, in a piece of text, right? Every time you meet, like, a name, you can, you can say that, right? So now you can count the number of persons, or you can make assignments to each person. Same thing goes with quantities, organizations, and time. Like, this is just information. Turns data into information, and then you can make a vocabulary out of that, right? So distinguish between application of grammar rules which is really old style, or just statistical model like Google, right? Where you just basically find out statistics about the data and then try to use statistics to, to quantify it in, in, a, in a numerical form. So text to numeric data, let's, let's give you an example, right? You, would, you could basically create a term document matrix. This is, like where, this is like the kind of way where you just use statistical method to group the text and to figure out what is going on in your in your in your library, for example. So you know, so let's say you have a lot of documents on your disk drive, or you know things like this, or document in a in a, in a website, or in your query. You know, you basically what you do is you do a term document matrix. This is all the terms you found, and the titles are the documents that you had. Right. So for example, that this word dad appeared only in, in document six. Word dummies appeared in document two and document eight, and investing appears in all the documents. You know, so basically this is a world that's sort of common to all of them. And then you, what you do is you do something called, you know, something called um, latent semantic indexing. So I'll tell you how this works. So like for example, date dads, right? There's like a vector, you know, one one here and the one here. Titles, you get another vector. Book is one in there, investing is in there, and values in there. So this title is basically characterized by these three values. Then you can basically take all of these things and create a space, which is the word document space. And by using this latent semantic indexing, which I'm going to be talking about in another lecture. And essentially, you can now group the words and the documents into a single space. You can sort of see which which documents are characterized with what words. And then you can sort of characterize the documents by this. So these are the documents that are about the book and the investing, and these are the documents that are about real estate. So you can also see which documents are similar. T3 and T1 are very similar, and they all talk about stock, stock and market. The stock and market is also similar because they appear in very similar documents, and T3 and T2 are similar because they have the same terms in them. So you can see sort of they're both sort of reinforcing, right? The terms cluster together, the documents cluster together, and then you can basically extract meaning from these co-clustered kind of things, right? What you see here. So then real estate is about this. So this is one way, a quick way, there's a, mo a lot more to it, but that's like essentially what you can do. Can, you can create, you can take text and capture the statistics of the text in a visualization that is sort of well understood. So that's that. So the next sort of step that has come up more recently is what's called word embedding. You know, word embedding, like, um, you know, word to vec is one of these word embedding techniques, or glove is another one. So the way it works, you train a shallow neural network on a corpus of text, like a bunch of Wikipedia pages or any, any kind of text, any kind of say, uh, corpus of documents you would, may have. And once you trained it, you can find ve weight vectors that encode ver similar words very similarly. You know, so you can like have a, a the world, the world, you know, the, it depends basically similar weight vectors will be words that appear in similar contexts. For example, microwave, oven, refrigerator up here. These are words that appear very similar contexts, and that's why they will have very similar weight vectors after training. Okay, and we'll talk about how this all training all works. 
but anyway, so they have these similar, and then they basically, because they have similar vectors, just like here, in this visualization here, they will then cluster together, right, because they have similar weight vectors, you can then use the weight vector as a, as a descriptor for this world, you know, and then you can cluster them together, so you have like all these house items here together, here the, these, these household items here, microwave, here you have uh, kitchen, vanity, sink, bathroom, these are like kitchen things, finish color paint, you know, here you have garden and hose, bell you like it, and sprinkler, so these are like sort of garden things here, battery chargers, and, and wash drill, and these are like work working equipment, you know. So th this is how you can sort of take words and, and find out which words are similar. That actually has a lot of me, this has a lot of applications. Because now you can really do some semantic analysis on, 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 on text that you get, you know, and it's not just data, now it's semantically related, you know, because you have, you know, so it's basically a semantic kind of clustering that you have done here. Um, what you can also do, which is pretty famous, and you may have heard about it, you can do this word embedding algebra, for example, and you have these, uh, these word embeddings. And you, let's say, you know, you have this word embedding of queen, and you have of king, and woman, and man. What you can really do is basically, when you sort of look at it, right, in this direction, like I can show you here, right, this red, this red direction, seems to be like the gender direction, right? So it gets, goes from man to woman, goes from king to queen. This seems to be like sort of the inherent direction of where gender goes, where gender changes from man to woman. There may be other directions where something else changes, but this is the gender direction. Then you can do this, what's called this, this uh, word embedding algebra, where you can say gender is woman minus man. Then you can say queen is king plus gender. And then basically you just replace gender by woman minus man. And then you say, uh, yeah, yeah. Then you say king, queen is king minus man plus woman. Right? And that's basically this algebraic equation. So you know, so this basically this kind of stuff you can you can you can do a lot of things with that, right? And it's just wanted like give you a little bit of an idea, if you don't know it yet. So visualizations for words, like if you want to like get the frequency of words, and you want to visualize them with a the visualization only, then you can do something called a word cloud. You may know word clouds, but this is one of them. You know, so basically, you know, in a text certain given text or text collection. These sort of words appeared more often than the, the, the heavy printed words appeared more often than the small printed words. There's an algorithm that sort of lays it out that there's no overlap and it's called word embedding, a uh, word, word cloud. Okay. There's many different variants of word clouds. You know, you can also constrain them in a shape that the, that the shape is also something that is interesting, not just the word cloud itself. So, you know, this is a word, word cloud. Then web logs. You know, you can, you know, this is basically another way to show words, like in a word cloud, you know, and then here, other data web logs, you know, you can, you can transform them into multi-dimensional uh, representation network traffic, those are packets, you know, you can count the packets, you know, number of packets of transfer, so on, and you can also turn, turn this into a bunch of numbers. In any case, all of these things will take data that are not really numeric and make them numeric. So now when someone asks you, you know, what have you learned in this class, you can only handle numeric data, you can tell them, you know, you can take pretty much anything to convert it to numeric, you just have to need a feature transform, right, and then you, then you, then you have it, right. So let's look at some essential graphical representations, okay. So, um, so for example, you know, I wanted to like, you know, do some advertising for D3 as well to show sort of show a little bit, show a little bit the capabilities. So let's, let's just fall, you know, start with some kind of, you know, uh, rep, you know, representation. Let's say you have like a stakeholder hierarchy that looks like this, you know, stakeholder customers and others, and then customers are procurers and users. So it doesn't really matter what it is. This is basically a hierarchy. And you want to visualize it in some, in a better way than just a tree. Okay, and this is like a function call tree. It's a little more complicated. You know, it's another one. And this is a much more complicated one. You know, so this is all, these are all hierarchies. 
and then you know you may have some questions about this right for example <clears throat> you may want to know how large is each group of stakeholders you know that's a uh, something you want to know maybe you know then you want to maybe see you know like create a you know or what fraction is each group with respect to the entire group it's also interesting right or what how is information disseminated among the stakeholders and how close are the individual are the individual stakeholders in terms of some metric so each of these things can be supported by a particular visualization so for here would you would have a tree with quantities here you have partition of unity right so there's a visualization that will address partition of unity really well or you know show it really well information flow you need a visualization that can show you information flow and here how close it is you, you usually use a false directed layout things that are sort of try to force things that are similar into similar places and drive other things away right you know so there's lots of visualizations that sort of try to represent these things by right? partition unity for example one of them is a pie chart you know and then that gets a partition of unity and a tree there's many different trees so one tree for example here is is you know there's many different ways to draw a tree you'd be amazed how many ways that there is right and some 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 visualizations try to invoke nature like to make make the tree actually just like a real tree so this is a real tree right it's a, it's a very large hierarchy and you can actually go your hit your go your mouse take your mouse at some leaves you know and then you kind of by the screen the screen flow here will tell you a little bit you know where the leaf branches you can also take a branch anywhere you go like you can basically isolate and figure out like what is the flow from here down to the root okay so it's like a tree so another form of tree is the collapsible tree like if you have a very large tree when you look at this tree that i showed you just now right it's it's pretty large and unwieldy to really handle right so you want something that is that is sort of collab that is sort of scalable so here's a tree that is scalable so you may have some a full laid out tree but you can collapse some nodes and make room right so now you've made some room made some room collapse this away make some room you know so now it's just the one single level right you can even make this go away right whenever it's blue you know there's something that you can click on so all of these you can click on so you can take this one here okay not much going on here wow here's a lot more going on right that's it right and every time you do this this the tree sort of scales in such a way that all of these nodes are laid out and and nothing is there's no edges are crossing right so you know so this is basically interactive right and d3 handles this this basically every mouse click has a rule and then you call a procedure that draws the web page in such a way that this 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 appears okay so zoomable partition layout you know that's a tree that's scalable and has partial partition of unity okay let's have a look what this looks like so this basically is sort of a you know so some nodes are a little more popular than others and you can zoom in and focus on certain nodes and you can zoom out again right go somewhere else you know so so this is basically d3 re response to these mouse clicks and then you tie a function to that mouse click and then you redraw the web page that that and you know that it like has this this new functionality that you want and usually what you've also seen there is transitioning going on right so it's not just like all of a sudden pops up with a new a new representation it sort of slowly transitions from one trend one from one representation to another and that's also this kind of animated viewing is also a really big part of d3 and it really has helped to make d3 a lot more popular right because it's really nice because you sort of it's sort of interesting to look at right you can sort of see the transitions also helps you understand where things are coming from right if it's just all of a sudden pops up something new then you may not know where it came from but if you if it animates from one state to another you can sort of you sort of understand how things go together right you know so because it's animating if it just were like all of a sudden for a slight moment make the screen dark or white and then bring up a new picture right then it's much harder to understand what's going on and then this animated viewing 
you can see a lot more. So sunburst diagram is another one of those trees, but it's more space efficient because it's radial. Also has only partial partition of unity. So I'm gonna call the sunburst. So this is a sunburst, right? So sunburst is the same hierarchy again, you know. So it, you can go here and it tells you a little bit how many how, how big the population this in this in this in this this is the first level of the tree, second level of the tree, or you can also go here. Tells you a little bit how much population is still in this in this have you still do you still have selected in the, in the middle? Then you go here, 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 and here, right? So now you're basically from home to product to product, 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 and then it have 3.5 percent. Okay, and then you can go somewhere else. You know. 0.16 percent, you know, visits. It's you know, so this basically that's how you can navigate it, right? So it's pretty nice navigation, right? This is a web page, you know, it's like it runs in a web browser here, my Chrome browser, and then you know it's interactive. So basically, everywhere I go, there's like basically a, you know, it it fig it knows what to do when the mouse hits a certain area because it knows what the area is, and then it calls the the function that redraws the tree with the right data because it knows what the data is, because it knows where the mouse was before. Right? And we talk, this is basically what, what, what how this works. So, uh, okay. Then, bubble charts. So there's no real hierarchies, it's just quantities. I have one, one here. There's a bubble chart. And below is the, D, the D3 code. This is what it looks like. We'll talk about D3 later. And, you know, this basically is a bubble chart. Bigger bubbles mean it's a bigger quantity. Smaller bubbles mean it's a smaller quantity overall and compared to overall. Okay, so it's kind of pleasing to look at. Then uh, circle packing. Quantities in containment, but not partition of unity again. So here's a circle packing. So it's a circle packing, right? So you can click on the circle here and you can see the elements. Click somewhere else, it, it zooms it back out, right? So now you're here. You click a button, it brings it out. You know, whatever you go, right? So it's basically can you can go more. So you know, this is circle packing. Basically, it's like a hierarchy packed into circles, where the circles just try to sort of embrace what's inside, right? And then each each size of a node it basically tells you how many items are in it, right? So that's that's the circle packing. Okay, then tree map. Tree map is pretty famous, and uh, tree map looks basically looks like this, where each cell in the so each color is basically a category is like a, a class of things, and 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 each and the size of each of these boxes corresponds to the number of items in that box. So if this is a disk drive, for example, then you have here on the bottom here you have like a, fo a folder. With not a lot of with subfolders, there's a lot of subfolders, but none of them have a lot of items in it, right? While while here it's like a folder has a lot more sub has subfolders with a lot more items in it, and sort of evenly distributed. Here there was like a lot of small folders here and so on, right? That they actually are subfolders. So in a way, basically this is sort of you know each box tells you like how many items in it, and then there's a hierarchy to it, you know, a, a tree level to it. And it's it's colored by different colors, so that's the tree map. Core diagram is also interesting. It sort of shows relations among group fractions, not necessarily a tree. So there's a core diagram. You know, it sort of tells you from this group here, it went to this group, or the other way around. From this group here, some of them stayed in the group. Some of them went to this group, some of them went to this group, some of them went to this group. Could be like they, they talk to each other, right? This group, some of these people just start to talk to each other, while the other ones, they talk to one and to other. This could be like a high school, or this could be a college. Some students stay in the same college for the masters, and the other guys, they go to different colleges, right? And they tell that the width of the, the, width of the court tells you like how many there are, right? And, you know, so basically that's what that is. And uh, hierarchical edge bundling, that's here. So this is basically similar to the core diagram, 
but it 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 also gives you a little bit of information flow in it, right? So you can basically go here, and you can really see there's sort of high there's a, a hierarchy going on, right? But also the relationship to other hierarchies, you know. So actually, you can you can rotate this too. Basically, you know who who talks to whom, right? So, yeah, so you basically can see this. And the, oh, what's very important here is the bundling of edges, right? So here to take the edges, see how it feathers out a little bit here, but then you sort of bundle it together, and the bundling of edges helps you a little bit to manage the space, right? Think about if it weren't bundled, then this these lines would go all the, all over the place, but now they're sort of held together as they traverse the circle and then they spread out again, right? So these guys, they stay together and then they, they, this, they, they partition into different streams, you know? So keep them together when they can be together or sort of let them, let them spread apart when they have to go to different areas, right? It's all a matter of to keep the space in the middle a little bit less overlapped, right? A little more clear so you can sort of see where things are going. But if you don't know where things are going, all you have to do is hover over, right? You just have to do this, right? Just go hover over, and uh, I don't know why I can't hover, you know, and then you can, oh, have to go to this, right? You can sort of go here, and then the level is shown by different colors, right? And then, you know, and you can sort of see where these go, but just you just have to follow the green trace. Collapse of force directed layout. I think that's the last one is the relationship one that I talked about. If you want to know, relate, you want to see like how different members are related. This is basically that display, right? It tries to organize itself in such a way that members that are related group into into similar clusters, you know. And then basically there is a little bit of some rules attached that that make that right. And then, as I said the last time also, right, you can sort of disturb that, right? You know. And then then this. It tries to get back to the official configuration because this is kind of like how it doesn't go always go the exact same place because there's a little bit of a randomness to it, but it tries to organize itself. Each each of these link spaces is represented by a spring, and the springs they want to have a certain length. So when it's too long, then it tries to collapse, and when it's too short, then it tries to expand, and then it sort of stabilizes. If you do this for all of them. At the same time, you optim optimize it, and it comes up with some sort of solution like this. Monoid desolation. Monoid desolation, if you don't know, this is from geometric modeling. A monoid desolation is basically a, a layout where the data points, you know, he basically where each cell, monoid cell, each of these cells, all the points within the cell are closer to the point that point that you see in the cell, the center point of the cell, than to any other point, right? This is like a tessellation. And then the Delaunay triangulation is essentially these little lines that you see here, right, that connect the dots. This is the triangulation, it's basically the, the dual of the Warner diagram, right? So the, you build it by taking two nodes and just cross the edge that separates these two nodes. And that becomes like a Delaunay edge, right? And do this for all the node pairs if you can. If they share an edge, you connect them, and then that becomes like this this still regulation. So you know, sometimes people want to see a cell around the point. Sometimes want to see the points connected. Okay, so there's like different ways you want to see this. And this here is basically an interesting application where you try to insert another point, right? I am basically taking the mouse and I'm inserting another point. And it tells me like how does the Warnoy diagram change as I'm inserting the point, right? So the point point gets inserted, Warnoy diagram changes, right? This is all written D3, right? All of this basically is a JavaScript code. And, and it's a web page, right? So that's another thing. So um, so data type conversions and transformations. So sometimes, you know. You you have a you know have a numeric attribute, and it's in 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 equi, equi ranges. So basically, you know you have something like this. This is like a histogram, right? And this is the number of values that 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 are in each group, age group, right? So this is like there's a lot of 40 to 50 year olds, fewer 50 to 60 year olds, and so on, right? So this could be like customer age, for example, 
you know. And then, you know, so basically you took your database where each person had a certain age and you binned it into these sort of bins, right? So, you know, you don't want to like have a continuous distribution. Now you have a bin distribution, which makes it easier to compare, you know, and then and, and sort of, you know, because you sort of binned it. One problem with that is that you may lose certain interesting features, right? Like there could be like one one age group that has very few people and another sub age group that could have many, many people. So there's actually very important to know that, right? Maybe below 45, there's not a lot of people and above 45, there's a lot, right? So this may be, this may be important for a marketing, marketing campaign, but you have like basically, you know, suppressed it by creating the average number for each bin, right? You basically, you know, you, you basically, you know, eliminated that, right? So another way to do that is to do like a equidepth histogram where each of the each of the bars are the same la same height, but you change the range of it, right? So between the range 0 and 22, you know, there's, okay, but this is a very large range to hold a certain number of customers. This is a shorter range, even shorter, even shorter, right? So it gives you a little bit of an idea how how dense is my is my value range, right? You can sort of see when the bars are really short, when the bars are really uh, narrow, then there's a lot of people in this particular area, right? And then the bars, if the, the if these these widths are very far, very large, then you know there's not a lot of people in the area, you know. So that is sort of a, that will that will help you overcome these problems, right? Because then you will have this this the the, the, the interval will. Will be will be adapt to the number of people in each interval. And we'll try to make it the same, and then you'll maybe you may see a little narrow range. And the, what this will look like probably you will probably have a a larger bin a larger bin size here and a shorter bin size here. That's what's going to happen here rather probably to to make them equal size equal height. This is called equidepth histogramming. Okay. This disadvantage here is you have to sort of store the beginning of the of the bin. Right. You didn't have to do that here because you just knew every 10 was a new bin. So you didn't really have to store the beginning at the end of the bin. But now that these bins become different, you'll, you'll have to store the beginning and the end. But you don't have to store the height anymore because the height is very the same. But here the height changes, right? So, you know, it's a trade-off. But you have to, you know, store one thing or the other. So another thing that happens often in practice is that, that you know, all... There are some bars that are dominating all the other bars, you know. So there's like the beginning, for example. It often happens when you do when you do like um, intensity calculations in images or something like this. But sometimes in other places too, you know, you'll have like sort of a lot of people on a very low with low very low values, and then it sort of fades out. And what really matters, is what really happens is this guy here dominates everything else. So you don't really know, is there like a lot of differences here or not? You don't really know because this guy suppresses everybody else. So what can, what can you do about this? You can apply a transformation, for example, a log scale. So you take the y, well, the y axis expressed in a log scale. And then you can sort of see these variations much easier. Because now you sort of compress the high values and brought up the small values up. Right, and that will basically help you to see the smaller values better. So log scaling is a pretty, a pretty famous kind of uh, transformation to see this. But there's a lot more transformations. I'll show you all these, right? So the black one here is there's no transformation at all. The log scale that I just showed you, that's the yellow. It basically, you know, emphasizes the lower values and sort of suppresses the higher values. The, the square root, the square root is, the square root is sort of similar, but not as extreme. That's the red one, then the log scale. It also emphasize the low values and de-emphasize the higher values. The, um, the, 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 uh, the, the square one is the opposite. The square sort of de-emphasize the low values, but emphasize the higher values. That's what the square does, right? So you basically, when you, when you run something to a square function, you make the larger distances even larger and the smaller distances you compress them, right? So it's basically a nice sort of way 
to enforce similarity a little more and, and enforce dissimilarity also more. Right? So this basically spreads things that are different very far apart and keeps things that are somewhat similar closer together. You know, that's like a square kind of transformation. Then the sigmoid function that really, you know, compresses the higher end and the lower end and really emphasizes the middle end, you know, and that the same thing goes with the log it, you know. It, the log it is the opposite. The log it actually emphasizes the lower and the higher a lot and then sort of keeps things in the mid-range very, very similar, right? So, so you know, there's a, there's a transformation for everything you want, right? You can sort of emphasize different things. But I want to, like, you know, warn you from this. You can distort the data that way and then maybe deceive people with that, right? So, you know, there's a trade-off between that, right? So, data representation... So let's go to this a little bit to talk a little bit about graphics of things. So when you look at an image like this here, what you notice is, a, is basically these sort of interesting patterns on these towers here, right? And then a little bit here on too. You know, <clears throat> they only happen because you took a large image and you, you, you compressed it down to a smaller size. Okay, and then this pattern emerged. If I showed a large image that didn't have pattern at all. And you know, what this called, what this is called is basically, this is called aliasing. And you try to take a big image and you make it smaller by skipping a few pixels for each. You know, you only keep every fourth pixel, every sixth pixel, and then this comes up. Enter aliasing is when you don't want this, right? What you basically do is called enter aliasing. What you would do then is you would take, you wouldn't just take one pixel, like every fifth pixel, you would average them and then, you know, get something like this. So it's like blurring now, right? Here it looks very sharp, but has these artifacts. Here it doesn't have the artifacts, but it looks a little bit like, looks a little blurry. So there's always a trade-off, right? When you, you can either see a lot of detail, but then you have maybe aliasing, and or you suppress it, you do anti-aliasing, then you may not see, you may see only blurred representations of things, right? So what is why is this happening? Okay, why is why are these why are these rings appearing? Okay, so let me explain this to you. So the reason why this is happening. This is the original original image, like it's just a, a part of this big image here, right? And at, at original resolution. So you can really see the individual bricks here and then the mortar in between. And um, let's say, let's say, let's try to reduce it, right, to this size, right? That's this size here, actually, or this size, you know. So I have to basically, the way I do it, the primitive way to do it is basically, you know, you go from here to here. And the way you see the rings appear, appear again, these sort of, you know, margins. So what that happened here was basically I, I took this pixel here and uh, then I skipped all the others. Then I took this pixel here, I skipped all the others, took pixel here, skipped all the others and skipped it here. And then just by chance, I always sampled this, these white mortar areas, right? Never sampled a brick, white mortar area, never sampled a brick. White order and never sampled. So basically, this pixel, this pixel, pixel are all going to be white and they're going to appear, appear as this white band here. You know, so because I didn't consider anything in between, right? I didn't consider that. So, you know, that, that basically is the problem, right? But what can I do? I can, I can what's called filter. I can, instead of just taking a point sample, I can take the average of all the points that are between this sample here and the other sample here. That's basically a filtering step, right? And then this is basically what I do here. So filtering is basically averaging, right? I'm going to average pixels in a small neighborhood to when I when I subsample it, you know, when or when I, you know, then I don't then I don't see these I don't see these artifacts, right? So for example, this is a 300 percent zoom where I didn't filter from here, right, so I basically see these sort of staircase artifacts, right, because I, you know, but here I filtered, here I filtered, you know, I actually blurred out a little bit, and I see this, right, so it's much more smooth, so filtering is very important, right, so 
Here I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in and I'm, I'm seeing these and here I'm filtering in between, you know, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get a much better smoother representation. But you can see also this looks a little sharper than this, right? This look, because I took, a, I took basically the neighborhood and, and blurred it out, right? And then here I just kept the pixels and replicated them, you know, and that's basically, you know, causes the staircasing artifacts. And here I sort of blurred things a little bit. That there's no staircase here. So what is smoothing? Basically you take a slice of window across the signal, stop at each discrete sample point and average the original data points that fall into the window and store the average value of the sample point and move the window to the next sample points, repeat. So this little animation shows this. You know, go back here again. This is the original data, take the box, average everything under the box, and they create this yellow, this green region from it. And now it's smooth, okay? So this is basically a standard way to do anti-aliasing, right? If you wanna like, you know, don't want a sample, you wanna sort of create a good representation of the region that you wanna simplify, then this is the way to do it, okay? And, you know, but this, the trade-offs are that it's like blur out a little bit, okay? So, but there's no more jaggies, like this is called jaggy, jagged edges. There's different filters, you know, there's like a box filter that I just showed you, or there's Gaussian filters, they're a little more complex, you know. When you look at it here, when you run a box filter over it, it has a little bit of these, these sort of box artifacts, and if you run a Gaussian filter over it, it looks much smoother. But as you can see, although there's no more box artifacts, this, this is a little sharper, right? You can sort of see the definitions here much easier than here, it's sort of blurred out a little bit. So there's always this trade-off, right? When you use like a, a box filter, you're gonna get these box artifacts because all of a sudden, you know, you move the box, all of a sudden you discover a new area, right? And, and you, you don't use any weighting to it. You just keep the original value. And, and this causes these artifacts, but you can get sharper features, run a Gaussian over it. You're gonna have a little more, you know, as you move the Gaussian across, the, it, the weights slowly increase. Right, and then it sort of blends nicely, but it sort of blurs things out a little more. Right, so there's all this is always a trade-off, you know, between between these representations. So solution to this really is, and this is basically why I'm telling you this. This is where D3 does has really made a breakthrough. Okay, so D3 solves this problem. Right, D3 never looks blurry. Right, and then uh, that's tell me the why that is. Right. So the solution basically is that the, that you, the data can't be refined upon zoom, right? You basically zoom in, and this is like instead of subsampling, you're zooming in. You're zooming in, for example, here. You know, you're zooming into this head here, right? You can sort of see these staircases now, right? Because you know, replicate it, right? You just all the pixels sample in a very small area, and they just easily see the head, or they don't see the skin, right? And that's why this sort of staircase appears. And same thing goes with subsampling, right? Then you basically, so the, both of these, it's either zooming in or zooming out, right? There's always, or always these, these artifacts happening, right? So let's say you have this, this figure here and you're zooming in. And basically, because this is an image and each, this, each is a pixel, as you zoom in, basically you just enlarge each of these pixels, right? There was used to be just one white pixel and now you meet, made two by two white pixels, right? And it becomes like a, a pixel patch, right? Because then, you know, that's basically what, it, what happens, right? And it, there is something called, you know, the solution is basically to, to, to not look at it as a, as a form, of, like in form of an image where there's individual pixels that get replicated. Instead, look at this as a, as a boundary, okay? So here's a boundary, right? So basically take each boundary, each, each, each place, like basically take all these, 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 uh, these boundaries of these individual features and represent them as a curve, as a, a B-spline curve or something like this. And then the B-spline curve is a descriptor for it. Then you can take this B-spline curve and blow it, inflate, make it bigger or smaller. Doesn't really matter, right? It's still a smooth curve. And you just fill in the, in, the inside, right? So there's this curve here that defines this region here. It's a nice, continuous, smooth curve. And here you just make the, make the curve bigger, still a smooth curve. And you just 
plan and fill in the detail. And that keeps things always sharp, right? Because now you have a boundary representation instead of a, a, a pixel array, right? So it's kind of it's a boundary representation. So this boundary representation is curve here, smooth curve is basically just a mathematical descriptor of a, of a, of a function. And then you just evaluate the function in a, in a larger place and fill it. And that's basically what happens. Vector. This, is, this is what's called vector graphics, because now it's, a, it's basically a vectorized description. You know, so you can paint with pixels or you can paint, you can paint with vectors. You know, this looks this looks a lot better than this, right? This is very uh, a pretty this very sharp image. No matter how you how much you zoom in, always sharp, whatever you do, right? And here you can always sort of see this fuzzy boundary, right? So you yeah. know. And uh, so this is vector graphics. So basically you represent each of these, you know, boundaries here with a curve and this curve, each curve is represented by some key points and the key points are interpolated by a smooth function like this. And then you did, and this is resistant to zooming, right? You can zoom in and out, it's always going to be a smooth function. You just, when you evaluate the function, you, you have to evaluate it. You have, when it's larger, you evaluate with more points, but you still get a function like this. If you take a bitmap picture like this, then you will, you're gonna as, as as you zoom in, you get you're gonna see more and more of the bits, right? So vector graphics, you can actually take pictures and encode it. You know, so you, here you took this regular picture and you zoomed in, looks a little blurry, or you take the vector graphics and represent it. So basically, you took the original picture and 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 found regions in it, and each region, you you. Uh, you know, represented by a by a by a curve around, and by a, by some sort of value in some sort of you know value in, in inside of it, right? So here, you you can really see this banding effect, right? There's like a curve here, another curve here, and then basically inside each region, it's a constant color. So it it has this sort of illustrative effect, right? Artistic illustrative effect, and it doesn't look blurry, right? So this SVG or vector, you know, scalable vector format really has has done a lot to make 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 things very very good looking, right? You can really, you know, it doesn't look as natural anymore, but it looks cartoonish, but it looks looks sharp, and that's what people want, right? It looks very sharp. Here's another one, right? This is this SVG. So it's it's somewhat looks artificial because it doesn't have this smooth gradation anymore, but it looks pretty realistic, right? This is like uh, Jim Morrison in vector graphics and outside. This one is uh, regular and this is vector graphics. Right? It's also much sharper than here. The nice thing is you can zoom to infinity always sharp, right? And that's that's really good about it, right? And D3 also uses support, it uses these uh, scalable vector graphics. And that's why it's always so smooth, uh, always so uh, sharp, right? All of these things look so crisp and clear, right? Like these 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 circles, the discs look always very clear. This one looks very 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 sharp, right? And here these these uh, sun sun these uh, sunburst displays look very sharp. You know, it's, it's all about because it's all it is is like boundary representation by a, by with a curve, and then and then filled in with constant color. You know, that's why it looks so good. So smoothing for denoising, that's like another smoothing uh, idea for smoothing. Let's say you have like a, a curve like this and you want to like, you don't really want to keep all this, these fluctuations because they're just, you know, noise. What you can do is basically you can smooth it with the, with the filter function. You get sort of the essence of the curve, but not the, not the, not the, the these, these sort of noisy ripples, right? And Let's go back to bar charts. Actually, bar charts or histograms, they actually are a natural smoothing operation, right? Because you go from here, which is the, the which is a continuous function, into, into a bar chart representation, right? So each bar is basically the average of the function in a certain interval, right? So what, what it does basically it's it sort of makes it more discrete, so it's easier to compare, right? So it's and there's also a data reduction, right? Instead of having to having to to save a number for each year, you only save a number for each for each decade or each each five years, 
and it will make it easier to make it easier to compute things with because if you want to if you want to compute similarity of two curves you'll if you keep them if you keep the continuous curve you have to basically it's like over 100 numbers and here it's only over 20 numbers right so it's 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 much easier right so this is another way and it's also much more the noise is removed there could be like small fluctuations that are just random noise, right? That which will which will disturb the, the the similarity computation, and the bar chart will basically take this away, right? Will be removed that way. So bar charts can also hold categorical. We also talked about this, you know, basically like this. One also compare like, oftentimes there's a question that comes up a lot. Compare bar charts versus histograms, right? So there's like, you know, a histogram and a bar chart. Are uh, somewhat different things. They both use, you know, height to encode a number, but the histogram is basically, you know, has the numbers has the bars close together, and the bar chart on the bottom has the bars apart. Because bar histograms basically show frequency of numerical data, like just like here, right, where I took, where I took this continuous curve and discretized it into a bunch of bars, bin bins, right. And then basically this is a frequency, of, or, or this, this is one example, but here I grouped it. Okay, sorry about, this was maybe not the right explanation. Uh, so what the histogram essentially does, it shows the frequency of numerical data. So basically I go, I go out and count things that fall in a certain interval and, 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 and basically assemble it into a bar like this. And there's no gaps, right? So this could be the number of people between 10 and 20, then the number of people between 20 and 30, number of people between 30 and 40, and number of people between 40 and 50, right? And this is basically the, the histogram of that, right? That's that's a little bit like this. And, and you know, it's basically the frequency. It measures the frequency of things. And not the average, but the frequency. Here, the average was measured and here it's the frequency I count things and 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 you know and, and list it. Like similar like to the images right where I made the value histogram, the gray value histogram or the gradient histogram, right? These are all histograms where I count frequencies, numbers of, of, of numbers of entities in a certain interval. Okay. And those cannot be reordered, right? And the width of the bus doesn't have to be the same. But you know, you can make equi equi width or you can make you know, sing or, or you can make the other one. And bar charts, on the other hand, they use, they compare different categories of data, right? For example, China, US, France, UK, the number of people that live there. And there you, to make that clear to people that it's not a, hist that it's not a, that's not a, like a subdivision of a different ranges within a continuous interval, you keep these gaps. So, so bar charts always have these gaps in between. To make sure that the to everyone understands that these things are different, that they are not the, that they are not there's no order to it, and you can reorder them, right? You can have U.S. first and then China, whatever it is, right? Or France first and then China, and then U.S. They they can be reordered because they're just you know they don't they're they're not they're nominal, not ordinal, right? But the width of the bars need to be the same because the width because the the width doesn't mean anything, right? It's just there's just a you know there's just a like a basic category label underneath it right so this is the difference between histogram and bars bar chart right both of them have groups and number of people in the group but here it's a continuous interval and you just subdivide it and here it's a here the separate separate entities okay so bar charts in 3d we're gonna do this a lot you're gonna do like for lab one which i'm gonna hand out next time you're gonna learn about. You can basically try your skills in in D3, and draw bar charts and histograms, and then you know, so basically something like this, but more interactive like this than this. This is like you're gonna be drawing stuff like this, but um, there's gonna be more stuff you have to do for that. So, okay, so um, so I wanna help you a little bit with histogram calculations okay so you know what to do you know so what you will be given data and you'll have to you have to basically compute these these you know histograms right the first thing you have to do is determine the bin size okay 
how much you know fits in every pin right so you basically take you they say the number of pins and then you figure out what is the max max value in your data and the minimum value of your data this is basically a range divided by the number of pins that'll give you the pin size so now you have a pin size right and that basically could be the pin size right if you have only if you have like let's say you took you take uh, you know instead of instead of six pins you you'll if out of five pins you take 10 pins right then one goes from 10 to 15 the other one goes 15 to 20 and so on right and have thinner pin thinner thinner bars but more of them right and that's basically what this says right so the pin size is the max data my mean of pins is the pin size and then if you want to figure out in which pin a particular value a particular data point goes then all you have to do is really take the value of this this data item minus the minimum divided by the bin size and find the, the bottom of it the the, the uh, floor of it and this this what this is this is basically the bin itself right so this basically is the index of the into a certain particular bin right let's say you have 10 bins right and this for this has a number of nine then basically the bin number nine is going to be updated incremented by one Right, the bin value array indexed by this number here turned into integer usually you take the floor then you then you find out what is the index of the array and then you in, you increment by 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 one and then you have basically now you sort of building the histogram as you go right you find the value you figure out what bin it is you inc increment it and after pass through all the values you'll have a bin val val array that is that has the right heights right so this is basically how you find this. And this is the graphical representation of it. So that's what you want to see. Okay, like I split them apart, but they can also be together. You know, you want to first you want to figure out what is the bin size on the screen. So you're going to take the, the width of your chart, which is something that can change, right? That could be like your web page. Maybe the web page you make them smaller or make the web page wider. So this has to be responding to that, right? So this anyway, this is the web page, probably usually the web page width or whatever you reserved of the web page which can scale right and then you divide it by the number of bins and that will tell you the bin size on the screen then then you take the center of a bar for bin with index bin index you just take the bin index the one you computed here right is the bin index and then times the bin size on screen they'll tell you how how many you know how where the bin is then you add 0.5 and this is the bar center on the screen okay bin index times bin size on screen plus 0.5 and then the height of the bar is basically the bin val array what you found once you've accumulated it right and you basically just scale it to the chart by the chart height over the maximum of the array right so you want to make here you try to make sure that every bin every histogram bar every bar is scaled according to the actual value it has right so if it's if that array has the maximum value of the bin array it'll be as high as the chart height and if it's if it's zero it's going to be zero right and you have to remember the origin of a web page is not the bottom corner it's the top left corner right so everything is going to be have to turn things upside down so to, to, to show it correctly right so always remember origin of a web page is not top left corner Often that can cause confusion. Then it, the, the chart is actually drawn upside down, right? Remember the deceptive chart I talked last time about? That will, will come out, right? So basically, this is sort of what I wanted to talk about today. This is just some things about, you know, practical things about like, you know, how you, you know, how you can, you know, make things a little, you know, we talked about the bin, how to do the, how to do histograms and then different charts talk about scalable vector graphics why things look good talk about filters and binning things like this right talked about transformation which is very important right maybe sometimes you see things like this so you have to have a transformation other transformation exist so you can you can tune the, the you know you can you can emphasize certain things of the data and de-emphasize others Right and so on. Right, we talk about bar charts itself and histograms. Okay, so check it out. Right, and uh, that basically concludes this lecture here.
the next lecture will be on uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the we'll, we'll get a little more concrete about things and also pass out the lab one so okay so thanks a lot talk to you see you next time